Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. I apologize for the delay. It wouldn't be a virtual conference without technical difficulties. As you know, 2020 has its way. I just want to say welcome, everyone. My name is Lindsay Boucher, and I want to welcome you to the Farmland Drainage and the Environment Conference. All right, today we are hearing from Jeff Olson, who's going to be presenting an introduction and an update on farmland drainage in Saskatchewan. Before we do so, I just want to quickly acknowledge uh, the numerous treaties across Saskatchewan. We have treaties number two, four, five, six, eight, and ten. And Saskatchewan is the ancestral home of the Plains Cree, the Soto, Nakoda Assiniboine, Dakota, Lakota Sioux, and the Dene Zulu people, as well as the home of the Métis Nation. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this land for centuries. So this conference comes out of a farmland drainage workshop that brought together farmers, academics, uh, local governments, environmentalists, and Indigenous peoples to address the issue of farmland drainage in Saskatchewan. And one of the needs that has come up, uh, or one of the um, yeah, priorities that has been identified from the Incentrix report out of this workshop has just been the need for raising awareness and communications around this issue. And that's where this conference was born out of. Um, so the Citizens Environmental Alliance is our host for this conference and they address the issue of farmland drainage and has partnered with many organizations to make this possible. So just a few housekeeping notes for today. Your mics will be on mute. Um, feel free to type in any questions throughout the duration of the presentations and you can do that directly in the chat box. And I will pop on at the end of the presentation to uh, moderate some questions. Because we started a little bit late today, uh, we might have just a shorter question period. Um, so feel free, you can send Jeff an email after the presentation if there's anything that you'd like to further discuss. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Olson. So Jeff Olson is a public, sorry, a retired public servant of 36 years in the environmental field. He has extensive knowledge surrounding farmland drainage and wetland loss as a conservation officer stationed throughout Saskatchewan, as a wetland specialist in the parkland ecoregion, and in the last 14 years of his career as a watershed planner with the Water Security Agency. Jeff is the founder of Citizens Environmental Alliance, a group of concerned forward-thinking citizens working on innovative solutions to contemporary environmental problems. He holds a recognized environmental profession, an EP designation, in natural resource management and is the principal for Minds Eye Consulting in Saskatchewan, which is involved in watershed management, environmental law enforcement, and present environmental issues in Saskatchewan. Jeff also ranches in the Beaver Hills area of West Central Saskatchewan. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Jeff. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, as well, sorry about the technical difficulties. It appears that the webinar is a little disjointed as I won't be able to uh, advance the slides myself and let me be taken care of that. So first of all, I'd like to talk about what drainage is. Uh, under the uh, under the law, they they have quite a a uh, definition that uh, includes the uh, deepening and widening of straightening any creek and, and that water source are using any uh, usually ditches but dikes or drain pipes or tiles and uh, drainage actually includes the removal of water and infilling of wetlands uh, so that's the part like well but the only thing is consolidating wetlands on an individual parcel does doesn't require life uh, one question that comes up is how much farmland drainage is in Saskatchewan? Well, the provincial auditor has stated that uh, estimates, because they don't have an accurate figure the problem, uh, is 1.6 million to 2.4 million acres of land have unapproved drainage on them, which is uh, 100,000, 150,000 quarters uh, section uh, with unapproved drainage. Includes 1,800 miles of drainage ditches within the 
displacement areas. And uh, in the whole province, the uh, estimate is that 95 to 99% of the drain. With the history of uh, farmland drainage, it, it all started even before Saskatchewan was a province with the Northwest Irrigation Act uh, coming into force in 1894. Uh, the fact was that it was recognized even back then that water was important for, for everyone. It uh, be left well wet and allowed to uh, allowed to be just divvied up by everybody as they see fit was the way to go. So they they uh, enacted legislation. Um, even the earliest drainage in Saskatchewan, uh, in the yellow grass uh, area of Saskatchewan uh, included a, a place where they drained to 15,000, 20,000 acres of, of, of land to prove it uh, for uh, cultivation. And this was not a problem uh, that existed uh, uh, for just yesterday, but rather uh, even in 1980, uh, it was noted that uh, illegal drainage is a major problem. Uh, at Cal 84, the Department of Agriculture uh, licensed the drainage, and at that time, made a corporation called Sass Water Corporation that looked after all the, the water management in the problem. Um, Jeff, the uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. This is Caitlin here. Um, a few attendees have written in that you're a little bit muffled. Um, is it possible to, to move the phone a little bit closer? Um, or I don't, I'm not sure if you're on speakerphone. I am on speaker. Do you want me off speaker? How's that? That I think that's a little bit better. I'll take it right off the speaker then. Okay, sorry for this inconvenience. <laughs> We've had a, a bit of a morning with these IT T issues. Anyways, I'll let you continue. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, sorry about that. <clears throat> so anyway, the Department of Ag licensed drainage to 84 tell SAS when SAS water was formed uh, to look after all the water management in the province. Uh, before 1981, uh, constructed drainage wasn't uh, didn't require an approval, but people could complain about it, and it could be closed if if it was causing uh, people problems. Uh, and in 1991, the federal government even recognized that the uh, single threat to wetlands uh, was the drainage of uh, of them for agricultural purposes. Now, can we play the video now? This is a video regarding uh, uh, some impacts to people in the uh, in the province. Okay, the video is coming. Um, to all of our listeners out there, you may have to click a button to be able to hear the video. So just look at your screen and you'll see something pop up.
in a plate. Hello? 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 Hi, right, Jeff. Yes, please go for it. What's that? Um, I think that's almost the whole video. I will pass it back to you, Lindsay. Thank you. Yes, Jeff, please continue with your presentation. Uh, which slide are we on? You tell me. Okay, I believe we're at the uh, uh, slide seven. So, okay. in which is this, uh, currently, I have how much farmland drainage is in Saskatchewan? Okay, just a second. Okay, so the the next one is the uh, uh, we said how much farm uh, is drained in Saskatchewan, and now um, we mentioned that the provinces developed the agricultural water management strategy to license all new and illegal drainage. As a part of this uh, drainage licensing, they actually have required licenses for areas that were um, essentially previously licensed for the major drainage ditches that go through the area, but didn't license individual farm off farm drainage, which was probably a mistake. But uh, they're going to go back now and uh, and license that as well. So 
when it comes to water rights, water rights, farmers don't have the right to drain. Now, many farmers believe that they have the right to to drain, and that's not true. Uh, the fact is, the water belongs to the crown, and you need government regulatory approval for it to be to be drained. Uh, the magnitude of farmland drainage in in Saskatchewan, uh, there was a wetland uh, law study in the St. Gregor uh, area near Humboldt uh, that had some some interesting uh, results. There was actually a, a notice of, since 1974 of the major loss. And you'll have to click through this. Uh, Lindsay, uh, showing uh, about a section of land uh, with all the wetlands on it and that sort of thing in the, the whole M McGregor complex uh, on the, with the blue in 1974. And then uh, up to 2002, 90% of the wetlands in the area were uh, drained, drained or lost. So why should we be concerned about drainage? Well, uh, water is the is the foundation of life. In fact, when we go to look for life on other planets, that's what we look for first is water. Uh, it's part of our individual health and uh, the economy, as well as other animals and fish depend on it. Uh, we use it for many, many aspects. Uh, and, you know, the quality of the lakes and rivers are affected by uh, activities upstream, including farmland drainage, but other other things like uh, releases of effluent from uh, uh, urban urban uh, cities and towns. And the other thing is that it all goes downstream and uh, affects other people. Uh, so, of course, I mentioned that it degraded uh, water quality. Especially with uh, farmland drainage, the addition of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, can add pesticides. Uh, we don't know a lot about glyphosate, but uh, the thought is is that uh, it's now a cancer-causing agent, and it's uh, actually being entered into the into the water system. And of course, we have uh, upstream erosion with uh, downstream sedimentation occurring. We actually, if we remove uh, wetlands, we lose the carbon sinks. Uh, it's a reaction uh, to assist with carb uh, climate change. Uh, we lose the potential uh, resilience for droughts in the in the area uh, in order to have water uh, to make us through um, you know have heavy uh, consecutive years of of uh, drought. We have uh, loss of groundwater recharge as well as flooding. We can get uh, the extremes on both ends because of this illegal drainage. And we actually have uh, local climates that are changed because of it, uh, therefore uh, reduce precipitation when you have less uh, moisture on the land. Uh, a desert, it doesn't rain much in the deserts. And of course, we have um, uh, what's important to a lot of people, uh, fish habitat uh, destruction and uh, increases in fish kills because of uh, added nutrients. I know the propel chain I've experienced myself has uh, intermittent um, uh, fish kills because of uh, low oxygen levels uh, as a result of algae blooms from high nutrients. And of course, loss of wildlife and waterfowl habitat. Um, we can't play it. I had a video clip, uh, but we can't uh, play that. There is uh, impacts to indigenous treaty rights. Um, they. Uh, Consist of a, uh, many different rights, but they were signed in the treaty. Uh, it's the courts have 
said that, uh, of course, it's the right to uh, fish, tra- trap, and hunt, uh, and use other products of the of the land. But this uh, also includes the the indigenous right to protect uh, water quality and quantity uh, on behalf of both humans and the ecosystem, uh, which is quite unique, uh, but is part of uh, indigenous culture. Um, based on that, the uh, Saskatchewan Water Management Strategy uh, has initiated a, a major impact on treaty rights. I don't know if it's, uh, well, I know it's not recognized by the province yet, and uh, uh, if, if it's recognized in the Indigenous communities, uh, I haven't heard uh, a lot of uh, things about the, the problems with that. And the drainage is uh, more than just the loss of the individual wetland, the, the water area. It's it's about the uh, adjoining natural areas that would be there. Um, if we look at the uh, Yorkton drainage in 2011, this is a quarter section just west of Yorkton. Uh, as you can see, there is a major uh, wetland complex in the top left-hand corner and intermittent wetlands throughout. And then in 2013, the next slide, it shows the individual started to uh, put drainage ditches in and has removed uh, much, much of the wetlands, the small wetland complexes in the south. And then in 2020, uh, he constructed the uh, works, I think in 2019 actually, but uh, this is a 2020 Google Earth shot of a drainage ditch that was uh, built. And uh, I actually went by there the other day and there's a crop to the edge of, of the ditch the, the whole way. So he's very efficient in making more crop land. Unfortunately, it took out the wetlands as well as uh, the natural areas that are, are with that. He, he actually left the dugout, as you can see, uh, because he still needs water for his uh, spring operations. So to talk about the uh, uh, farmland drainage in a uh, little more technical, uh, involving growth, growth and effective drainage areas, the growth drainage area essentially is uh, the whole amount of land within a watershed, uh, and it may or may not drain, uh, but it's it's all the area that's included. Uh, so the effective drainage area is the area which contributes runoff in uh, normal average year. Uh, it may not the one year, but it may the next, and and essentially that's the effective drainage area. And the uh, non-contributing area is, is the area that doesn't normally contribute uh, runoff unless there's a, a flood of the century. Um, normally that area wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, runoff. So here we have uh, showing uh, a visual view of the non-contributing areas and the effective drainage areas and the gross areas. Uh, in the second slide we'll see that uh, once they start taking out wetlands it's increasing the effective drainage area which means uh, more and more water that hits the land goes downstream and isn't uh, captured uh, within the watershed. So in the uh, in the slide involving the province of Saskatchewan in the red area, that uh, is the normal uh, non-contributing area. Most of Saskatchewan, because it's prairie potholes, uh, is non-contributing area, and uh, that'll be uh, evident in, in some of the information I, I give you a little later here on the drainage networks. So we're going to show some examples of drainage. Uh, the Smith Creek uh, watershed um, was uh, one of the most studied watershed in, in Canada, uh, in the uh, Langeberg church area. Uh, the 1958 a uh, map on the left shows uh, some minor, very minor drainage, but uh, for 
mostly intact wetlands and complexes. The 2009 on the right showing the uh, web of drainage networks that are involved in draining that uh, that small portion of the overall Smith Creek uh, watershed. Uh, the next uh, slide shows that even after 2009, there's been a uh, between 2009 and 2015, there's been additional drainage uh, and additional loss of a, a thousand acres of wetland. So, if this uh, wetland loss is continuing uh, uh, even up till till now. If we see the Smith Creek 1957 overall watershed map, you'll see the blue areas are the uh, the wetland uh, areas, and then the Next slide, the 2000 shows uh, the starting of the of the drainage network uh, in the lower portion of the watershed, and then some in the minor uh, top. On 2009, showing more uh, watershed drainage ditches, um, and the 2015. Uh, showing even more. One of the things to note is uh, in the very northwest corner, the watershed actually expanded uh, because the uh, they put drainage ditches over the divide between the two watersheds and then entered, uh, allowed the drainage ditch to drain water from one watershed to to another, which wouldn't have normally occurred. Even in it, it would it took in uh, additional gross drainage areas, uh, making them effective and not uh, not uh, within the other watershed. Um, there is, uh, Water Security Agency has some networks that they've been working on. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, they've been supporting these uh, uh, on these networks. Um, they're Essentially acting like a developer, and not the regulator, as they're supplying uh, much of the technical aspect and, and funding. Uh, all the networks about 14,000 acres in size. Uh, in every wet uh, network, there's about 72% wetland loss on the average. And uh, so far, there's been no environmental assessment required for any of them. Uh, in in the case of the Blackbird Creek uh, network, there's uh, 19,000 uh, acres in the uh, gross drainage area. They're actually going to be adding additional acres from another watershed into that drainage area. That's where the 970 acres addition comes from. And the reason that the, the two 19,000 numbers aren't exact is um, in hydrology, it's not a uh, really exact science that uh, the line gets to, to, to be redrawn a little bit at, at times, and uh, that's up to the hydrologist to sort of sort that out. So that's where that anomaly comes in. So the Blackbird Creek Network is 19,265 acres in gross. The effective uh, drainage area. Um, Historically, it was only 5,001 acres, uh, which was 26% of the gross uh, area. But now, with this new drainage, the new effective drainage area is going to be 17,544 acres, which will be 91% of the total gross drainage area. And that's a 350% increase. Uh, Blackbird Creek actually spills to Manitoba, and Manitoba is concerned about this additional water and have been for quite a few years. And this was only one of the networks that will spill into into Manitoba. The uh, stream flows uh, are uh, expected to double. In the uh, uh, it doesn't matter which uh, frequency, whether it's two years, five years, or ten years, uh, they may be faster, but they're thought to, to double. In the case of the 600 Creek drainage network uh, out of Storthoaks, uh, again along the Manitoba border, 
the 600 Creek Network technical uh, information, the gross drainage area was 28,911. The historic was only 5% of that, which is 1,482. But now the new effective drainage area is going to be 10,625. So we're moving from essentially a, a network that had very little water leaving the land. It, it all pretty well stayed uh, there. Uh, and now we're moving to an area in which there will be 36% of the of the gross drainage area uh, is going to be is going to be drained, uh, which is a 700% increase from normal or natural, sorry. And excluding uh, areas of tile drainage, that was one of the things that uh, I know that there's tile drainage occurring there. Uh, we're not sure how much, and uh, for some reason the water security agency is not advising the engineers to consider tile drainage as a part of uh, the drainage area. And of course the flows in the uh, existing, I'll say creek, but it's more like a little stream, uh, will be increasing uh, uh, three and a half to almost uh, four and a quarter times what they normally would be. The uh, water security uh, agency has announced that they started on an additional 20 uh, drainage networks. Um, the three that I'm most um, knowledgeable about is Cupar Creek South, Cupar Creek North, and Stony Creek. We're uh, just above the Black Creek drainage network, and the map will show that that dumps into the Cinnabine River upstream of uh, of the uh, dam at Shellmouth, and that uh, that area is is about 192,000 square acres that are going to be affected. They it's got some natural streams and and uh, natural drainage to it, but the expectation is that there will be um, many more acres of wetlands and and lands drained that nor normally wouldn't be. Uh, we've yet to see any of the uh, information as far as the effective drainage area from the from the engineers uh, as uh, we are not a, allowed or when we request uh, that information from the conservation development authorities or for those that have it or water security agency uh, uh, they normally don't give us that unless we give them a freedom of information act request and pay money to get that information. Right now, uh, farmland drainage is not subject to environmental uh, assessment. Uh, this, the proponent must self-declare the environment, which is uh, not unusual for, I guess, that area, but uh, I guess if you don't want to apply, you don't have to worry about it until somebody complains or, or that sort of thing. So that, that doesn't really work very well. Uh, right now, the Water Security Agency are not referring any one uh, to environment to have it go through any type of screening process, uh, which is uh, problematic in my mind. And that uh, that's not that shouldn't be Water Security Agency's job to determine whether or not uh, something should enter that. They should be advising them all that they need to take that to Saskatchewan environment in my mind. And in fact, on the major Quill Lakes diversion, um, Saskatchewan environment is determined that there was, wasn't a need for an environmental impact assessment. And uh, there's questions on, on how that the decision came about. And, and thanks to, uh, to Chief Todd Pegan, uh, they entered a court case to then have that that uh, it required a, a environmental assessment or go through the process. One of the things about our environmental assessment uh, process is that there is um, no way to consider cumulative effects uh, in any any portion, including farmland drainage, wetland loss, which is a major shortfall. And the uh, other bad part is that federal environmental assessment process defers to the provincial 
environmental assessment. So if, if there is one or if uh, the province says it doesn't need one, then the feds go along with that and say that uh, it doesn't need one. So right now, the agriculture management strategy itself hasn't been a part of the process. Uh, it's not get, gets reviewed, even though there's a major uh, impact from it. Uh, it's seen by me and others that the conflict of interest uh, by Water Security Agency as is the proponents, uh, providing legislation, funding, technical support, uh, they appear to be a, a proponent and not just a regulator. And they are continuing to license and drainage projects without uh, proper mitigation uh, or a wetlands policy. Uh, and despite the provincial auditor's recommendation uh, to do so in 2018. Uh, the enforcement and compliance area, the uh, previous to 2015, there needed to be a, a form of complaint involving uh, usually a, a downstream, a normally a downstream affected landowner. And the affected meant that it was a financial impact. But after that, the uh, Water Security Agency said that they can, anyone can make a complaint, which is done as good. But the bad part was is that the uh, Water Security Agency has a lot of other work that they say they're working on, or, uh, no doubt they are, uh, but that as far as they're concerned, those things are uh, priority, not uh, not complaints about the environment. So they say there's no money, inclination, I question whether it's the political will to deal with the environmental impact uh, from from drainage, uh, and right now they're not looking at it. So since 2014, uh, the agency's issued 3,570 drainage approvals, and to date, no approvals have included wetland retention as a condition of approval, even. Some of the networks that have gained licenses and the farmers have said that they would maintain certain wetlands, that that has not been included in the condition of the license. Is, is the real problem not just not having a license, to, you know, having the piece of paper? Of course not. It's, it's that it needs to go through a check and balance system that uh, we know things are done correctly. Uh, there's standards that need to be in place to protect the environment and people. And there needs to have those standards enforced. So if we have drainage laws, why does illegal drainage continue? Well, farming in Saskatchewan is uh, one of the biggest economic drivers. And based on that, uh, uh, lessening the amount of farm to be uh, used or cultivated is not seen as a good thing. Uh, the provincial government uh, doesn't really want to deal with the issue. It doesn't matter what political stripe uh, you are or they are. It, uh, it is one of those issues that is not uh, very politically correct to be dealing with. Uh, it's going to be impacting farmers uh, ability to, to make money, uh, even though um, it, what they're doing may be harming the environment. Um, the Quill Lakes enforcement uh, results, uh, 2016, um, there was a letter sent from the Minister of, of the Water Security Agency telling uh, landowners with the illegal drainage to, to consolidate or close the drainage works. Um, the Water Security Agency identified 30,831 acres of drained wetlands that are contributing to the Quill Lakes and uh, affecting uh, the level in the lake, uh, adding to it an already high amount. And since 2016, only 22 acres have been closed. Uh, there's a clip within embedded in the slide. Can you play that or no? Um, sorry, can you say that again, Jeff? I say if you 
it, um, if she advances it on the Quill Lakes enforcement results, the president of the Water Security Agency, um, there's a, a clip embedded in the in the slide itself. Uh, it cannot be played, or should we just proceed to the next uh -huh. slide? Um, I think Lindsay's just proceeded to the next slide, the proposed wetlands policy. Okay, that's fine. That's... Okay. So the proposed wetlands policy that uh, the Water, uh, water Security Agency is, is going, and I'll have to say I, I went over to the Watershed Authority in 2002, and uh, Wetland policy was an, an issue at that time. The, the uh, strike the committee, which I was on, but uh, uh, of course uh, nobody was willing to do uh, what was necessary as far as uh, uh, saying that there needs to be mitigation and uh, even no net loss or, or uh, curtailing the loss uh, of uh, wetlands. Uh, right now, the proposed wetlands policy includes the protection of uplands. As mitigation, which uh, I don't understand very well, uh, having a wetland equate to uplands, even if you do on a multi multiple, uh, they can include the creation of wetlands, which may be impoundments or dugouts with slow release culverts. And then, in some cases, they, they if it's possible, they're going to uh, cultivate these areas. And um, if at all else fails, if they can't mitigate, they may be allowed to uh, uh, to compensate or pay money of a hundred dollars per acre per year. Uh, my question is, what what are they planning uh, to happen for the money? Is it going to go in general coffers, or is it going to be a, a wetland fund? Uh, the unfortunate part, I remember when the uh, wildlife habitat uh, certificate came in for ten dollars to go towards habitat and uh, the uh, the uh, government at the time decided that they were going to take seven of those dollars uh, to put in general revenue and three dollars would go to the habitat fund uh, which which uh, seemed like more of a new tax and that's the question I have about about the landlords paying the offset fee and the, until the policy becomes approved, uh, all the licensing right now doesn't require any mitigation except for sediment control and high flows. And that's problematic. So to me, the uh, mitigation of, of uh, wetland drainage with, uh, with the uplands, uh, grasslands is, uh, an apples and oranges sort of thing. They both provide unique habitats, but uh, they're totally different uh, when it comes to what they provide for ecological goods and services. And and another question, uh, you know, they are allowing um, wetlands to be removed and replaced uh, with mitigation in, in dugouts that, as shown in the picture, will be cultivated uh, as close as they can get and, and uh, what sort of habitat with that form, we're not sure. Uh, in the past, wetland mitigation to the government of Saskatchewan uh, for the twinning of the highway number one, the, the provision of off-site watering for landowners was seen as a mitigation. Uh, the Dry Lakes Project uh, Network, uh, they allowed construction Constructed wetlands with dugouts, which uh, doesn't doesn't seem to me to be a replacement for wetlands. And in the uh, Blackbird Creek project, the conversion of cropland to upland forages is, is allowed, and uh, that uh, doesn't equate to me as being logical. Uh, in monitoring compliance and enforcement, the uh, past practice was there. Uh, we just don't have the time. If um, I was involved in the uh, in the conditions of licensing for an environment and having the water security agency place those conditions on the permit when they were violated, they uh, said they didn't have time to check on these 
uh, things, these environmental issues. Um, even now, although they say anybody complains, um, uh, they are working almost exclusively on downstream affected uh, landowners that are priority. And uh, it, uh, I said they'll take anybody complaint about the environment, but uh, they just don't have time to investigate. Uh, conservation officers have now been engaged by water security agency to help them in in the enforcement aspect. Uh, unfortunately, although this conservation officers would like to do more, they understand the issue well, and uh, and they they see the illegal drainage going on, uh, Water Security Agency has very rarely directed them to do anything uh, about illegal drainage. Uh, on 2018, I uh, happened to be going up to Kelvington, sell some of my cattle at the uh, livestock exchange there, and I come across the Van Patten's Creek, and this was the major uh, drainage that was done in the uh, spawning marsh next to the highway. Uh, they essentially created a berm, uh, eliminated the, the uh, marsh area on both sides and, and put a drainage ditch uh, uh, right through. Uh, it was complained about to the conservation officers and they were given direction by WSA that uh, WSA would handle it. And to my knowledge, uh, nothing has ever been done uh, of enforcement or compliance to return this to a good fish spawning area or or to uh, revert it back to to the natural condition. So the agriculture water management strategy, in my view, is the greatest publicly unaware threat to Saskatchewan's water, wetlands, and natural resources. It's uh, something that I, I don't think we're, we're we're seeing it coming. It's it's very bad. It's the small things that are adding up uh, to a, a great tragedy in my mind. And the biggest problem is, uh, do we know the consequences of, of what we're doing with all this uh, uh, drainage and that sort of thing? And I, I don't think we do. We have the the uh, scientific evidence that this is problematic, but uh, we, we haven't come to decide that, that that is a problem. And the biggest thing is, you know, what about the cumulative effect of all the drainage that is occurring? I know you'd think Manitoba would be more concerned. I know individual landowners there are, rural municipalities, but it appears that the province of Manitoba is not really Concerned about it, and uh, they they just are accepting it. It seems. Uh, what we can do about it, of course, increase uh, public awareness. Uh, not a well-known issue uh, uh, with the public. Uh, insist that uh, there is a wetland and drainage policy that includes bona fide mitigation. Uh, demand that the network drainage project undergo an independent environmental assessment, uh, either provincially or federally. As a part of that is a whole education of the public about uh, what might be occurring or, or happening on, on the uh, landscape within those networks. Um, we should have an improvement in our environmental assessment process in Saskatchewan. I, I recall going to a meeting in Saskatchewan environment in the mid 90s to discuss the fact that the cumulative effects were not considered and it uh, seems today we wake up in uh, in 2020 and and nothing is uh, really been cha changed as far as that so we need to consider cumulative effects and include the public provincial strategies that have, will have or may have a significant effect on the environment be subject to the federal act. Uh, we, we should see that uh, water security agencies develop uh, uh, a precautionary principle um, just because we don't have all the scientific evidence uh, definitive that it's a problem. Uh, we shouldn't say that uh, until we do, 
we we can see uh, water is too important to um, allow us to make those mistakes and try to go back later to correct them. That's um, all I have uh, for now, and I'll turn it back to Lindsay to to uh, moderate the questions. Thank you so much for that thorough presentation, Jeff. All right, so we have quite a few questions here. Um, of course, as you all know, we have gone a little bit over time, so we won't have time to go over all the questions. However, we do have access to them, and, um, and we will uh, follow up with you after this presentation. Um, so maybe I'll have Caitlin ask one or two questions. And if you haven't had a chance to type in your question yet, of course, you can uh, type it in the chat box as we go, or of course, you can send Jeff an email afterwards as well. So Caitlin, I'll pass it to you. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. Um, Jeff, there's a question from a listener named Laura. Um, illegal drainage has been such a long running issue in this province and a great big white elephant in the room for far too long. Would there ever be a possibility of a class action lawsuit on behalf of impacted producers, indigenous nations, um, the public against producers who drain and the WSA slash province? Well, uh... Going the legal route is always one that is, you know, in people's minds and that sort of thing. The, the trouble is, is that uh, it almost seems like the lawyers uh, are the ones that uh, benefit the most in it. And just because you go to court doesn't mean, even if you win, that you get the things that you want. So uh, uh, before we even tackle it that way, I, I don't think we've done enough with with landowners that, that do the draining to actually uh, come about with a collaborative sort of uh, uh, approach with that. Uh, uh, we de definitely need enforcement to, to stop any additional uh, drainage that's going on. I know even even now I could say that there's uh, draining going on this fall and, and why we can't uh, uh, get people to take this seriously and stop, I, I don't know why. But, but the legal route uh, will be entertained by the Citizens Environmental Assessment or Alliance, sorry. Thanks for that answer. Um, there's a couple question, uh, um, questions about uh, best practices in other provinces. Do you know of anything? And can you see a point where water management versus drainage can be balanced? Well, there's no doubt it needs to be balanced. I mean, even when we consider the economics of it, that you know, we, we aren't going to uh, decide people shouldn't farm any longer and we should revert back to totally natural. Uh, the biggest thing that I think about is, uh, it, and through the environmental assessment process we would get it, was a good understanding of what we're exactly doing uh, as a result of that and then making appropriate changes. If we're, if we're creating problems in the, uh, with water quality in, in the system, then we need, to, we need to change. Things have to be uh, done differently. As far as other provinces, I know Manitoba's just come up with a a wetlands policy. <laughs> I was reading in the Western Producer. There's many producers not too happy about that. Um, it's uh, I, I believe uh, Alberta's got one as well. Whether they work this as well as they seem to on paper, as in the actual world, I don't know yet, and uh, that remains to be seen. But they're they're trying to tack, tackle the same problem we have. Thanks for that answer. Um, there's been a couple questions about the video. Um, I've actually just sent that link to everybody in the chat box. So if people want to watch the video, um, you can just copy and paste that into, into YouTube. Um, and Jeff, there's um, another question. Um, 
by a listener named Andrew, monitoring and regulation compliance by water security agencies obviously a problem. What about the producers? Does this reflect a new generation of less consideration of neighbors and the environment and bigger farms and equipment? Is it typically a real need for more acres of production or a desire for convenience with GPS um, tracking? And in lines with that, there's um, a few comments of from listeners about um, agriculture being more industrialized and should be recognized as an in industry like oil and gas, forestry, and mining. Um, do you have any thoughts or comments about that? Well, there's no doubt that the the uh, agriculture of 50 years ago, and even even 20 or 30 years ago, doesn't exist. Uh, with the smaller farms that we used to have, uh, uh, putting it all into production and, and almost acting like a corporation as we do today and having you know, 10 and 20,000 acres uh, under cultivation and, and seeding brings uh, greater pressure to those corporations to to uh, be the most efficient as possible. And uh, we need we need to really tackle that. The the size of the farms has uh, gone great greater and uh, totally right. The the environmental aspect uh, has to be considered as uh, agriculture is an industry and not uh, not uh, sacred and, and uh, not viewed as uh, allowed to do things that other industries wouldn't be allowed. Thanks for that answer. Um, last question, could the province of Manitoba raise concerns to the federal impact assessment process considering there are cross-border implications to drainage in Saskatchewan that are not being addressed by the government of Saskatchewan? Yes, um, as far as I'm concerned, they could. They haven't. When it came to uh, us trying to engage the Canadian Environmental Assessment uh, uh, Authority in uh, the federal government, uh, we sent a petition and a letter, and it's on their website of their decision. Uh, Manitoba really didn't uh, have any concerns that they brought the government of Manitoba, but they uh, they say that there's uh, uh, individual or there is individual problems uh, uh, downstream that uh, we know of and that are, are are complaining both First Nations and Indigenous communities as well as as other uh, farmer and farm groups, but uh, it hasn't really done anything. And if um, my speculation would be is Manitoba's got a problem with drainage, and they they don't want to be seen as uh, criticizing Saskatchewan for their drainage because they got enough of their own. That would be the way I, I would see it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that answer. I think that's all the time we have for today for questions, so I'll pass it over to Lindsay. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you Jeff so much for your presentation and all your questions. Uh, tomorrow, we are hearing from Patricia Furnice on the regu regulatory framework underlying wetland drainage in Saskatchewan. So if you're interested in joining us, uh, you have the link there for uh, to register. Um, if you're interested in the background of this conference and to learn more about the Farmland Drainage Roundtable, you can access the Incentrix report, which is hosted uh, or it's housed on the Environmental Society website and their issues and water. And of course, um, for any up-to-date um, information regarding the conference and farmland drainage in general, you can follow Citizens Environmental Alliance Saskatchewan on Facebook, and there will be a video of the recording housed on their YouTube channel as well. Of course, this uh, conference is not possible without uh, our partners, so we'd just like to take the time and thank them. That is the Colleen Lakes Eco Museum, Citizens Environmental Alliance, of course, for hosting, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Last Mountain Lake Stewardship Group, the Lower Capel Watershed Stewards, Nature Saskatchewan, Public Pastures Public Interest, Saskatchewan Environmental Society, the Sierra Club Canada Foundation, SAWS, which is the Saskatchewan Alliance for Water Sustainability, and the Saskatoon Wildlife Federation. I just want to say thank you so much for attending our webinar today, and we look forward to having you join us for the rest of the week. And with that, I'll say take care and have a good day.